I, you know, just one of the one of the hallmarks of my existence has always been, you know, just a, a, a an insane amount of anger and rage. It, it's it's been there as long as I've known. So I don't have a conscious memory of not having rage, right? So earliest memories of life when I'm five years old, I have rage like you can't believe, and it's it's a problem all my life. So as a teenager. If I go more than two weeks without punching a hole in the wall of our house, it's a miracle. I mean, I am so good at drywall. You can't believe how good I am for all the stuff I have to repair around our house. Like I'm breaking windows, I'm breaking, it just doesn't, like I just, and so in a way, and, and, and of course I rationalized how much boxing saved my life because I had this amazing outlet for my rage, right? If you, I got to basically exercise six hours a day. I'm hitting punching bags in people all day long. And it's just a beautiful outlet that keeps me out of jail. Um, and a big part of that rage was inward, right? So it's, it, it, it's not rocket science to understand that a person who has that much hatred for everyone has an enormous amount for themselves. And so one of the things I didn't realize was happening was what my inner monologue was. Because as you can appreciate, your inner monologue is so frequent and ubiquitous and present that it's easy to almost forget that it's there. I mean, that's the, you know, that's the, that's the sort of uh, dangerous part about it, right? Is kind of the, you know, the David Foster Wallace, this is water thing. The fish are swimming through water. It, the water's everywhere. They don't even realize they're in water. You don't unrealize, you don't realize the subconscious stream of thoughts that constantly flow. But eventually I became aware of just what that self-talk was. And it is, it was no longer the case. It was the angriest, the most violent self-talk you can imagine. I mean, it was like, there is no mistake that I could make that was anything other than my perfect, perfect standard that didn't result in what I would call my inner Bobby Knight going ballistic. So it just didn't matter. Like it, 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 it sounds silly under, it didn't matter. If I didn't perfectly cook a steak, if I didn't perfectly nail something I was doing, if, if, if I didn't do anything that was perfect at what I described as match grade perfect, I mean, I would want to beat myself to a pulp and I would scream at myself. I mean, it just, it's, it's again, it's hard to describe. And I, I hope that most people listening to this don't understand what that feels like. Well, it became very clear that that had to change because when you are, when you are that, when you hate yourself that much, by definition, you are going to be an insufferable prick to everybody else. Like, because you're, you're just, that's going to spill into how you interact with the world. So I, you know, was working with a therapist who was one of the people who was sending me to this place in Arizona. And basically it became clear that, you know, they, 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 they proposed that I could shed this trait if I was willing to do a certain amount of work. And I was like, there's no chance. Like, I'm 47 years old. This is the only way I've ever interacted with myself. How in the world could this be undone? It would take another 40 years to undo this. And they're like, no, no, no. Here's this exercise you're going to do. So the exercise was every single time I did something where I would have that self-talk, I would have to immediately stop myself and pretend that it wasn't me that just did that, but it was one of my closest friends. And instead, I would audibly speak to that person, there was nobody else there, but speak to that person as though they are the one that made the mistake. And I, were to, I was to record that on my phone. So if I'm out there shooting my bow and arrow and I don't get a bullseye, instead of screaming at myself, I have to say, oh, imagine it's my buddy JR who just missed that shot. What would I say to him? pick up the phone or, you know, pull out the phone and say, of course, something different. And of course, what I would say in that situation was much kinder. I mean, infinitely kinder. It's like from saying it to my closest friend, I'm going to 
say it in a very kind way. And I had to take uh, a copy of that audio and text it to my therapist. Oh, wow. Yeah. Talk about vulnerability. So can you imagine? I was all on board this practice until you mentioned that at which point, and I, and I trust my therapist uh, um, to a very deep level, but I thought, wow, that that's a, that's a mountain. Well, this, you know, this poor person got a lot of text messages, a lot of, a lot of audio files. But here's the part that just blows my mind. It only took, I don't know, I, I can't remember exactly. I'd have to go back to look at my journals. It only took about four months to get rid of Bobby Knight. Like, you know, again, we, we had kind of a mental model for what this looked like, which was Bobby Knight was the chairman of the board. He sat in the boardroom and nobody else got to talk. And for those that don't know, Bobby Knight had a terrible temper. Yeah. Yeah. The worst. Right. This is the guy that was throwing chairs yeah. across the basketball court. Level 11. Yep. Out of 10. And, and all of a sudden, like we got to the point where Bobby Knight is not even in the boardroom anymore. In fact, I, as I say this today, like I don't really remember what he sounded like. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me. And, and I've had some really amazing opportunities to bring him back. Like, it's not like I'm making fewer mistakes, right? It's not like I'm better today than I was three years ago at all the things that I do. I'm not. I'm actually probably worse in many regards. Uh, but the difference is, you know, I can communicate with myself. I, I think I can say this. I think I can say lovingly, right? And, and maybe not as lovingly as some people can. I, I still think I'm probably maybe just a little higher standard with myself than maybe I need to be at times, but, but I'm just not beating myself up like I used to. And I think by extension, I'm beating other people up a lot less. Um, so, so with that said, yes, I learned a lot. And I learned that people like me can be overly analytical and that, that hyper analytical nature can lead you astray when you think that your intellect is giving you a fact-based explanation for a set of circumstances and you rationalize them away. Well, this happened to me when I was a kid, but, you know, like, I get it and it's not really a problem. And as a result of that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, these are actually some positive things that came out of that experience. And, and, and I think the real aha moment in my journey, which occurred um, on, a, on a day that I remember very well, was the day I finally dropped that. I dropped that, um, that rationalization and I allowed myself to experience what a child would experience in that moment and then understood what the implications are for a child going through these things. And I think that was, that was really the first time in my life I ever accepted emotionally something that I had intellectually always said, yeah, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's just, you know, that's just life and those things happen and lots of worse things happen to lots of people and, and that's okay. Um, and I think, it, it's not that once I emotionally accepted this, I became a victim. It, it wasn't at all. It just finally allowed me to realize, oh, I can let that go now. Like I, I don't have to. I, I don't have to. I don't have to be a slave to the adaptations that came from that. I can, I can, I can surrender. If somebody, if you feel wronged, um, assuming that wrong was it, you know, wasn't a sociopathically uh, motivated. What is your process for going about repairing a relationship fracture like that? Again, this assumes that this is a relationship that matters, right? So in every interaction, you're you're only really able to optimize around one thing. And you have to decide, is this one thing that I'm optimizing around the relationship or is it the outcome? I mean, there are other things to optimize around, but you understand that those are different. Maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit. I think I get it, but I, but flesh right, that if, out a if bit. I, if I'm at the uh, if I'm at the market and I'm trying, if I'm at, if I'm trying to buy a new car, and I'm sitting there talking to the car salesman, uh, that's a relationship. That's an interaction. 
Now, I want to buy this car for as little as possible, and he wants to sell the car for as much as possible. Well, in that interaction, my relationship with him means nothing. Let's assume I don't know this guy and he's not like my best friend. I'm optimizing everything around the outcome. So everything I do in negotiating and in interacting with him personally is based on getting the best outcome for me. It's very selfish, right? Nothing wrong with that, by the way. He's well, doing he's the doing same the thing. same, Absolutely. right? Exactly. But now, for example, pretend that you are the car salesman. And you're one of my closest friends. And it's your dealership. Like, it's your money. Like, it's, you know, you can't sell this thing to me at a loss. I don't want you to do that because I, I want you to be able to make money. And similarly, like, you care about me and you don't want me to overpay for this. So now we're negotiating and we're both trying to optimize for an outcome, but there, our relationship also matters. It's a very different negotiation at that point. And so I, I think... I always try to ask myself this question when I'm having some interpersonal conflict, which is, what am I optimizing for? So, you know, if, if I'm having a quarrel with my wife, I have to remind myself that the outcome is, the objective or outcome is not necessarily the top priority. You know, being right all the time, which is my default state, it's just to be a bull in a china shop. It's to be authoritarian instead of authoritative. And that's that doesn't work if the relationship matters. So to answer your question, the first thing I'm going to ask myself if I'm trying if I feel slighted is what is the nature of the relationship? Is it even worth trying to do something about this? And presumably you're asking the question because the lens is yes. This is someone who you you care about more than in just a transactional way. You know, usually what I've realized is I can't try to approach the situation without fully understanding myself, and that takes a while. So generally, and this is where, you know, I still, one to two times a week, I'm still working with a therapist. I have to kind of try to figure it out on my own and then usually bounce it off a therapist and say, well, I think this is why I'm upset about this. I think that when this person did this or said this, I felt this. First of all, am I, am I correcting what I felt? Because remember, sometimes you might, at least for me, this was the case. I would just feel anger in response to every interaction. But what I didn't realize was that anger was really just another emotion that was superimposed on top of hurt or superimposed on top of fear or superimposed on top of shame, or superimposed on top of something else. But I didn't know how to articulate any of those other emotions, so the only thing I could really articulate was anger. So if anger is the only thing I know, and anger is the only response I see, it's not very helpful, it's not very insightful. So that's, that's a big part of it, is being able to deconstruct what I'm feeling. Oh, what I really feel is loss, or what I really feel is abandonment right now. And that sometimes takes a while to figure out, at least for me. Like, I, I'm still, you know, I'm only a few years into this journey, and maybe other people figured these things out when they were in their 20s, and so they're veterans. They can do this more, more naturally. But that's step one. I, if I don't really understand what's going on, I can't even begin to try to approach this person to say, this is how I feel. Um, this is... You know, how do you feel and, and, and what are we optimizing for in this interaction? 